I know I lost. Yay. There we go. Got a lot of familiar faces coming in. Welcome everybody. Welcome. And some faces and or names that I haven't, haven't heard before. So it's great to have you on here. Going to have a great session today with Dr. Renee Thompson. So awesome. It is the top of the hour and folks are going to continue pouring in here, um, but wanted to welcome you to today's webinar on um, bullying and incivility in the workplace. We know that this has you know, cause some of the unnecessary employee turnover that we at Magnet Culture try to fight. And um, so, yes, welcome everybody. My name is Kara Saletto. Of course, I'm the president and chief retention officer here at Magnet Culture. Love, love, love doing what we do, helping leaders create better places to work. And one of my really good friends is joining us today. So excited to have Renee with us. So welcome, um, Dr. Renee. Renee Thompson from the Healthy Workforce Institute, who specializes, you all, can you believe this? Everyone says like, I never thought that job existed, right? But she specializes in reducing and eradicating bullying and incivility from the workplace. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and have her introduce herself, and then we'll get started with some chat here. Sure. Thank you so much, Kara. I'm just um, really happy to be on this call. Unfortunately, it's to have a conversation about a topic that is really negative. However, as you know, in your world, uh, if people don't feel supported and they don't feel that they're working in an environment where they can be their best selves, and if they're dealing with bullying and incivility, they will leave you. And especially right now, it's a, an important topic that I think we should all be uh, discussing because there are some things that we can do. And it's interesting. <laughs> I had to laugh when you said that there's actually somebody who specializes in this. And, you know, people always want to know, how did I get in, involved in this topic? And uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for more than 30 years and I've pretty much done everything you can do as a nurse. And it was about 11 years ago that I realized it didn't matter what organization I worked for or what role I had. I swear there was always a group of people, usually other nurses, who made it their mission to make my life difficult. Ooh. And I just thought like working in healthcare is hard enough, especially right now, without worrying about your coworkers right. making it harder. And so I took a leap of faith, quit a great job that I love to uh, start my own company. It was really just me raising awareness and talking about bullying and incivility and the negative impact that it has on employees and patients. And then from there, it's just evolved to now we, uh, I'm the CEO and founder of the Healthy Workforce Institute. So that's yeah, that's how I got to this point. Fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And Renee is a fantastic keynote speaker, um, as well as having all of her trainings and workshops and uh, coaching and books and all kinds of stuff. So I'll tell you about all that fun stuff later that you can access on her website at healthyworkforceinstitute.com. Um, but throughout this session, feel free, you all, to put questions into the chat or into the q a box here on zoom we're happy to answer those and of course afterwards you can always reach out to renee at healthyworkforceinstitute.com they have a contact form where you can put questions in there and then be sure to connect with her on social and linkedin for sure so feel free to keep those questions coming but i already have some questions that that i want to talk about because you know i specialize in retention and this issue comes up a lot but i don't go this deep and i'm not the expert specific on the bullying and incivility stuff. So I wanted to start first with, okay, come on. We all know what bullying is, but what exactly is incivility? What, what's your thoughts on that? How would you de define those or, or separate those? Sure, thanks. Uh, it's actually a, a great question and one that anytime I'm presenting anywhere or I'm doing consulting and we start the initial, okay, let's, let's talk about um, what bullying is, what it's not. And the reason that I think it's so important that we have the conversation about it is because not everything is bullying. And, and we tend to label all bad behavior. Oh, she's a bully. Oh, he's bullying this person or me. And especially <laughs> yeah. if you're in a leadership role, 
it is super important that you are crystal clear on what bullying is mm -hmm. and what it's not. And so um, if we just take a look at bullying and incivility, here's what bullying is. It's actually the repeated patterns of disruptive behavior with a conscious or unconscious attempt to do harm. And in this oh. country, we actually have no legal definition for bullying. We have a legal definition for harassment and discrimination, but not for bullying. But what's important for everyone uh, watching to know is when you suspect somebody um, is a, a bullying someone else, or maybe you're you know, being bullied, I always look for three things. Number one, there has to be a target. So that target could be one person. Let's say I'm fine with everyone that I work with, but it's just this one person. Maybe it's you, Kara. There's just something about you that I don't like, Ugh. okay? So I give you the worst <laughs> assignments. I exclude you from things, but I'm fine with everyone else. But there has to be a target. The mm. second is that the behavior has to be harmful. Uh, Kara, if I roll my eyes at you, is that harmful to you? Now, you might be thinking, well, it certainly isn't nice, right? It wouldn't be nice. But it's not technically harmful if it's the only thing that I do is roll my eyes at you. Oh. But let's say I need to relay information to you and I leave a piece out, an important piece, so I can set you up to fail. Think about this in healthcare. Mm hmm who is that harmful to? It might be harmful to the patients or may be harmful to your customers. And then the third, and I think this is one of the most important things for all of us to consider. It can't be one time I get testy with you in a crisis situation or when I'm under stress. It has to be repeated over time. Okay. But that's what bullying is. Target, harmful, repeated. And civility is different. It can actually be the same behaviors. It can be, you know, sabotage, you know, eye rolling, gossip, all of those things. But generally speaking, incivility is that low level um, people like that inconsiderate, disrespectful. It's usually we see the gossip, the mocking that I help the people I like. I don't, you know, help the people I don't like. And when we look at organizations, we actually don't find as much bullying as you think. So I do a lot of, I call them like deep dives. I go in and I, you know, take a look at what's really happening on the ground level. Mm -hmm. There's actually not a, a lot of bullying, but there's an awful lot of incivility. Ah, well, it's and you just proved me wrong because here I thought, oh, I know what bullying is. And then I was like, oh, wait, no, I didn't realize that it has that criteria. <laughs> <laughs> it really it. does. And, and I think it's so important that, especially if you're in any type of leadership role, that you understand this, because most organizations, if they have policies regarding bullying, and if you can show that an employee is truly bullying, they've identified a target, the behavior's harmful, you know, it's been repeated over time, that's sort of easier to handle. Okay. You've got a policy about that. But in civility, in civility's culture, right? And culture, not so easy. So, if a company doesn't have a bullying policy in place, is that what it needs to include? Is those three criteria in particular? Absolutely. So, we've done some work with organizations to take their existing policies and tweak them because one of the things that I find is missing in a lot of, let's just call them conduct policies. Okay. <laughs> but there's no clear definition. Right. So it's just, they, they just take all the things that they don't want employees to do and they just throw it together in a policy. Yeah. And I think, I mean, you have to be careful. You can't be so prescriptive, but it is important to include what bullying is, what's workplace violence, you know, physical violence, and then to have something in there about incivility or just unprofessional conduct but have that clear that, you know, there is a target, the behavior is somehow harmful. And it, the key is it has to be repeated over time. It can't just be one time. Now we can call that one time incident a microaggression and it needs to be addressed, but it's not part of a, a bullying um, situation where you really need to then, you know, address that through policy. Right, right. You know, we teach, 
over and over and over that we have to communicate our expectations and that professionalism is subjective. And so when we talk about handbook adjustments and changes and things, sometimes we'll say for attire expectations, you can't just say wear appropriate attire or even even terms like business casual or something like that or or casual wear because well while one person doesn't think pajamas would be casual they're thinking jeans and a nice shirt or you know that type of thing or that business casual doesn't include jeans or you know there there's varying definitions of that so I love that of actually looking at your policy language and is it too stringent or is it not enough uh the same with like leggings right it's like if you just say wear pants some people think leggings are pants you put them on one leg at a time <laughs> right. Um, and other people see that differently. So just being a lot more clear and intentional, I think that's probably a, a really good word when we're talking about policies and handbooks and and those types of things as well. So, yeah, um, you all may have already assumed that with her nursing background, Renee does a ton of work in healthcare. Um, but as do we, as far as about 70% of our businesses in that space, and then the rest is industry agnostic. So even though we may give some healthcare examples today, just know that this applies across everywhere, right? So one question I have, particularly in the workforce crisis that we are in right now with all the great resignation and all the the folks quitting and whatnot is protecting new hires. <laughs> That's I'm on a big soapbox right now about how do we protect our new hires. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts about avoiding that whole eat their young scenario as we refer to it as any hazing because we've got to keep those new hires longer, particularly at organizations that have a lot of lower wage frontline workers that just see the churn right now. And they're not even keeping folks 30, 60, 90 days. Right. Uh, I know that that incivility in particular is pushing a lot of folks away just from the conversations I have with right. the workforce. So can you talk about that protection of new hires so that we can keep them longer? <laughs> well, that is... Um truly uh, something that I am beyond passionate about is that new uh, employee experience. So the work that I did before, I quit that really great job, start my own company, really centered around the student nurse and the new nurse experience. Okay. And so I built new nurse programs and you know we had internship programs, new nurse residency programs and looking at the preceptor program. So if you don't work in healthcare, I want you to think about when you hire someone and you know, their orientation program, do they have somebody, you may not call them a preceptor, but are they matched with someone who is kind of showing them the ropes? And I've done a lot of work on this and we take a look at what does somebody new need when they start a, a new position somewhere and especially if it's they're new to the organization. Um, there are a couple of things that I think really translate to, to any industry. If you have, um, when you uh, bring on new people, if there's someone who does precept them, who's responsible for their onboarding, the most powerful thing that you can do is to have that, and I'll call them a preceptor, call that new hire a week before they're supposed to start. Yes. And just say, hey, my name is Renee. I'm going to be your preceptor. We are so excited to have you here. Do you know where you're going? Do you know what to wear? Do you know what to bring? Is there anything I can help you with? <laughs> we are so excited because Kara, yeah. I have surveyed thousands of new employees and one of their biggest fears is not about acclimating to the work itself and learning the work, but it's about the people and in particular that one person who is going to kind of show them the ropes. Right. If you can have that person call them ahead of time, oh my gosh, they you can alleviate so much of their stress. And so when we look at protecting them, you have to make sure that those people who are really onboarding them are equipped with the skills and tools that they need ding, ding, ding. <laughs> to be able to onboard them. And like yeah. you said, protect them. So there's some, some roles of that preceptor. It's socializer, it's educator, it's evaluator, and it's protector. 
I love and it. making sure that you protect them from any of the badness that's in your department. Sometimes it's warning, heads up, but I think it goes beyond that, Kara. And I know you you do this so well. It's making sure that you're creating an environment where you, you don't always have to tell people, okay, don't be mean to this person or mm-hmm. make sure that we're giving them opportunities to learn a skill that they need to, you know, as, as beyond even a re- retention strategy. Yeah. But yeah. how can you create a culture where that's just the way we do business here? We protect our new people. We nurture them. We support them because we value them. Yes. We want them to succeed. So, oh my gosh, this is spot on. And then it makes me think about the barriers. And then I keep just hearing, well, nobody has time. Nobody, we just have to get them on the floor. We just have to throw them to the wolves. We got to sink or swim. Sorry about you. And so I want to give a shout out right now to the executives on this call. If you are in an executive seat, where you are a decision maker on staffing, you are a decision maker on compensation for folks, you are a decision maker on policies and whatnot, Um, heads up that we need those people. We cannot be so busy in our departments that the supervisor, the manager, or even the team members don't have time for new hires. Because you just listed, Renee, all these things that that I would say just a mentor, or some people call it their orientation buddy, (laughs) you know, different terms, no matter what industry you're in, you need that mentor protector. You said they educate, they socialize, you know, this whole big list that Renee just mentioned. And so it's very, very important that we staff to that, that we understand that is not unproductive time of, oh, I got to pull somebody off the floor to go you know, let this new hire shadow and mentor. Yes, you have to have people. We have to have enough manpower on our teams to have proper mentorship, proper onboarding. And that leads to that protection piece as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to to your point, it's easy right now, especially nobody has time. And, you know, a lot of people have left their positions and their organizations. So now we're trying to do the same amount of work, if not more work with less, you know, number of people. Therefore, it's even more important, right? Hiring someone. <laughs> right. It's almost chicken or the egg. Yes. And, and that, know, that they're dealing with right now. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not to just say, oh, well, just give them the time that they need. We know it's not that simple, but there needs to be an intention for that. And here's a way that I think you can um, sort of mitigate those challenges and that, that everybody's dealing with right now, as far as we got to get them up and running so we can get them out there. Yeah. Some people, they understand that and their orientations may be a little shorter, but the key for you is to at least acknowledge that, touch base with that new hire. And the recommendation is that whoever that direct hire reports to, that you need to do a 30, 60 and 90 day check-in with them. Sure. That was (laughs) pre-COVID. I was just going to say, have we shortened that timeline now, Renee? Because I think 30 days is waiting too long long. to check in. You're right, Kara. And and that wasn't even happening before COVID. And so now it's not not actually happening at all. So yeah, yeah, absolutely minimum 30, 60, 90. However, if you really want to retain that person, I would do a weekly check-in with them. And this can be two minutes I would say, let's say, Kara, you're new. I would say, Kara, Kara, do you have two minutes? I just want to check in with you. Mm -hmm. You know, and and the the checking in was um, asking them maybe some pointed questions about their their onboarding and then asking them how they're doing, like how are they coping with such a big change? This is new for them. And it's so it's a little bit of left brain asking questions about, you know, what they're learning, but then that right brain emotional, I care about you. How are you? Is right. there anything genuine. For you? Genuine yeah. check-ins, right? Absolutely. Oh, it's not like, okay, check, 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 check. I checked in with this one. And you know, like the, 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 the check boxes that we do because the staff will know that you're not being authentic. Um, yeah. There's a, an article that I always recommend for leaders. It's a Harvard Business Review. It's called, I think, Begin with Trust. 
And it talks about the three attributes of trust for a leader and its logic, its empathy, and its authenticity. And every leader has one of those as they call them their little wobble. And empathy is about caring. Mm-hmm. If your staff don't believe you truly care about them, then they will overlook everything else that you're trying to do for them and they will leave. Yep. So it's how do you make sure that you're, you're genuine because, and Kara, you're the expert in this. If you really don't, you know, you, you can't act like you care if you really don't. And if you don't really care about your employees, <laughs> yes. maybe you're not in the right role. Okay. It's, oh, it's kind and of hard to say, but that's a perception mm-hmm. also, right? You, you can't care, but if your people think you don't care, then it's lost, right? Yeah. They have to feel yeah. that way. It's just like a person who says, I'm not intimidating. <laughs> it's like, you don't get to decide whether you're intimidating or not. Other people decide that. So, um, okay, I, I love this question that just came in. They said, um, what are, how can we assess or what questions can we ask ourselves to make sure we're not part of the problem? that we're not the bully or being uh, in, in civil, is that a word? <laughs> um, uh, that, that we're not the one who is right. pushing away those new hires or anybody on our team. How, how do we assess that for ourselves? So whoever said that, I love you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. Yeah. Because it all starts with you and turning the mirror back on yourself. Like if you want to improve your culture and you want to reduce incidents of bullying and civility and just people being mean to each other, you got to turn that mirror back on yourself first because it is so much easier to blame everyone else or to pick out everybody else's faults. We actually have a self-assessment that's free. Yeah. And (laughs) and actually it's titled, what if you're the bully? Mm -hmm. that's a good one yeah and it asks questions like um do are there some people i help and other people i don't help do i laugh um you know make fun of people and there's just a whole list of questions i think there's either 10 to 15 questions um that i i believe they can get it on my website if you go to my website go to the resource page if not carol i'll make sure that i i give you the link for that yeah absolutely Um, somebody just say how can you get this out this (laughs) yeah um, but healthy it, workforce yeah. institute.com go check that out and then we'll send it out to everyone after the session and put it in the the show notes as well under the recording so yeah that's great and and it's good to think about that you just brought up a few that i hadn't thought of like do i laugh at somebody when there's a problem you know or am i the person who like helps them get up and and that type of thing and i even think about of course when i hear bullying i just go to children I go to childhood. I have a seven-year-old and I just think of, okay, I I hope he's not getting bullied at school today and whatnot. I was actually bullied pretty severely as a child. I was, I had bright red hair. I was an easy target. um, And I was, I was a big old nerd. Okay. (laughs) And so a lot of people would knock the books out of my hand. And I tell you, if the lockers had been a little wider, I would have been shoved in those lockers, but I was very lucky because we had really, (laughs) teeny tiny lockers at school and so I think a lot of times we just think people grow out of that and that that doesn't come into the workplace but it absolutely does and and we do see it um, even if it is what you referred to earlier as the microaggressions as well so when when we know it's happening what do we do what do we do about that? Whether we're in, if can you share that from two different perspectives? If you're a leader and you know there's someone on your team who's doing that, what do we do about the bad apples, right? Or a toxic type of person that's keeping us from b- building the culture we want to have with our folks. So what do we do as a manager? And then what if I'm not a manager? What if I'm just a team member? Then Renee, what what am I supposed to do? I don't I don't have the say in, right. in changing that person's roles and responsibilities or anything. So can you talk to that for a minute? Oh, yes, this is my world. Okay. (laughs) Like, okay. We've been talking about bullying and incivility for decades. We know what it is. We know what it looks like. We know the impact, but what are we going to do about it? And that's, that's really our our specialty. And I'm all about the, the simple practical strategies 
to address disruptive behaviors, not these complicated algorithms. If somebody does this, then you do that, and then you do this, if they do that, and ah, it's, it's kind of uh, chaotic. So uh, from a, a leadership perspective, first of all, you can't expect people to adapt their behavior if they're not even aware their behavior needs to be adapted. First. So the first step is all <laughs> heightened awareness. You've got to start talking about behavior at work. Uh, we do a series of things with our clients where we send articles and we do assessments, like what if you're the bully is one of them, and really take a look at what's happening there. And, and I had a leader, uh, her and I talked yesterday, and she's, she's new to her organization, and she said, I think there's a problem, but the executive leaders don't think so. No. I'm telling you. Okay. And right. I said, well, you can't convince someone that they need to solve a problem that they don't think they're having. Yeah. So you have to heighten awareness and you have to find out. I said, you need to quantify how behaviors are showing up. And again, we have another survey for that, but you really need to find out what's happening. And so if I'm a leader, I'm going to heighten awareness and I'm going to find out like, how are these behaviors showing up in my department, in my organization? Mm -hmm. However, once you heighten awareness, then it's setting very clear expectations for behavior. We okay. usually in every organization have great performance expectations, part of the job requirement, like what do you need to do? And it's yeah. always you know, the performance reviews. Yep. This is what you sure. need to accomplish, but we don't do a good job setting behavioral expectations. Mm -hmm. So in this organization, this department, we talk to each other, not about each other. Giving each other feedback is part of the job. Kindness is not optional here. Yeah. Part of the job description. But then you get your teams to be a part of that. So we do an activity with our consulting clients. We bring the entire team together and we ask the question, how do you always want to be treated? By each other. And how do you never want to be treated by each other? Oh, and then we great. create just a, like a list of norms in this department. And then we use that when we hire people, when, you know, if we're doing any type of um, performance reviews, it's part of it. So I'm going to, that's just two things. Okay. I'm going to shift now to the individual and the strategy for the individual is also another strategy for the leader. Mm -hmm. Kara, in my experience doing this work, and this was actually the work that I did in my doctoral program too. I actually uh, taught senior nursing students how to protect and bully-proof themselves before they start their first job, okay? okay? So back to the new employee experience. But when we look at why bullying and incivility continue, one of the reasons is because we use silence as a strategy because we don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to handle it, especially if we're afraid of any type of retaliation. So we do what's comfortable. We do nothing, You're including right. leaders. And I was a leader. I was a frontline nurse manager, had the worst uh -huh. <laughs> unit with the worst reputation of the entire 700 bed hospital. And of course they didn't tell me that when they interviewed me for the job. <laughs> um, I had no idea how to deal with it. And I was not successful. I, I left that position after a year because I just had no idea how to deal with it. So here's the simplest way that you can start addressing behaviors as an individual. I'm working with someone who's treating me, you know, in a really uh, cruel way, or even as a leader, just name the behavior. You're yelling at me. You're criticizing me in front of other people. I just saw you roll your eyes at me. Huh. When I left here yesterday, you said everything was fine. And then I found out you were talking about me behind my back. You're not lecturing them. You're not, um, you know, making them feel badly about what they've done. You're just naming their behavior. And I'm telling you right now, you, it sounds so simple. It sounds ridiculous, but it's a game changer. Oh my gosh. I, you just saying that I, it like brought this emotion over me of like, Oh, wow. <laughs> just knocked my books out of my arm. 
yeah, people don't do that. We, we don't say that. And you're not talking about the emotions you nope. have, or even you nope. hurt my feelings, nope. but it's the actual behavior that that person took towards you. Because to your point, awareness is the first piece and they may not even be aware. I mean, you know, in some cases they are, some cases they're not. So, okay. But that, I, I have to be honest, but that is uncomfortable for me. That's awkward. Yes. And I don't want to address conflict. I don't, I don't want to cause conflict. I don't want to be a part of the conflict. I'd rather just avoid the conflict, Renee. Right. <laughs> so, okay. You gave me step one, but then, then what do I do? So um, it's so funny. I'm the expert in this and yet I get uncomfortable when I have to speak up to someone too. Okay. Okay. So we're not alone. We're not, no. alone, but there's a way to get over it and to yes. address it without just walking away and hoping it goes. Yes. Away. Um, there are a couple of things with that. First of all, I never um, tell people to get comfortable speaking up. That's not the goal. What I say is it's oh. okay. If you're uncomfortable, have the conversation anyway, That's name good. the behavior anyway. It doesn't matter if you're like, I'm uncomfortable, but I still have the conversation now. And, and the other thing is, all right, let's say I'm working with a group of people and there's this one person that every time I see this person in the office or in, I, I, I get like a surge of hydrochloric acid in my stomach, <laughs> right. my peripheral vision, like, oh my God, that's her, that's him. Yeah. Don't start with that person. <laughs> start with that one start with someone that maybe you already have a pretty good relationship with who can sometimes maybe just treat you in a way that's a little condescending or intimidating okay start small okay start with someone that's you know not the queen or king bully in the department and start with those overt behaviors the yelling the cursing the eye rolling, like start with those behaviors, tackle the, those passive aggressive ones, that, you know, yeah, exclusion. Oh no, we invited you. Oh, you must not have heard us. Like we were talking, no, no, no. We, we, we asked you what you've won for lunch. You must not have, have heard us. You know, you never pay attention. And then you start thinking, <laughs> did, did, did they invite me? I just didn't hear it. And you mm. know, they probably didn't. But right. don't tackle those passive aggressive people first. Okay. So it start with someone that you already have a decent relationship with. Start with overt behaviors. And then as you develop the skills, and I'm going to give you one more strategy. It's actually my superpower <sighs> of everything that I do. I am a huge scripter. So I have lots of scripts. They're all over my website. I teach this a lot where you pick a script uh, based on a common behavior that somebody has been, you know, kind of throwing at you. And, and I'll give you an example. Uh, my daughter was working with a teacher who was really rude to her, would say really rude things to my daughter and embarrass her in front of other people. Huh. And she gave me you know, lots of examples of this. So I said to her, hey, Kate, here's what I want you to do. The next time she says something like this, where she embarrasses you in front of other people, look her in the eye and just say, I'm offended by that comment and then just walk away. And this is what I told her. So you have to practice it because I don't know, Karen, yeah. <laughs> like when somebody says something really rude to me in the moment, I don't know what to say. Like I usually end up saying something stupid. Uh, 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 like, uh, uh, right. <laughs> but then the next day in the shower, Oh, I can think of all sorts of things to say. Okay. So you identify behavior, you choose yeah. a script. My daughter's case is to tell her I'm offended by that comment. You practice it. And it's funny. I have a whole video about this. My daughter's like, I was waiting. I was waiting for her to say something. And this teach, it, she was, it was a teacher and she finally did. And my daughter said to her, I'm offended by that comment. And the teacher did a, oh, you know, I'm just messing with you. You know, I'm just kidding with you. Here's the thing, Kara. My daughter worked with her for another year and a half. That teacher never said anything like that to her again. Nice. Scripting works. Not That's all the time. It. That's but most it. of the time. Mm -hmm. I, I think it is just some of the little changes, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a whole new culture. It's not a whole new approach. It's making one comment. It is calling out that behavior. It is letting people know 
that I was offended by that comment, um, wow. that type of thing. And so that's fantastic. I can't wait to get my hands on some of those scripts. And, <laughs> and I'm that. always coming right. up. With and I'm sure that's what you teach too in your workshops is walking through mm -hmm. and again, maybe not getting comfortable with it, but building confidence in the scripting side of it um, and helping folks. I mean, I've been in workshops in my career where I learned you know, conflict resolution and other things. Step one, identify this. Step two, do this. Step three. And so that scripting, it really makes sense, even though that's like so basic, duh, of, you know, it'd be nice. I don't know what those scripts look like. So, okay, that's great. So you talked about in management, you talked about if you are the person that needs to address that. We had a question come in that said, what if it's my coworkers? How can I you know, we talked about onboarding and protecting the new hires, but what if I'm a colleague and I see this happening to someone else who isn't scripted for that or isn't confident enough or willing to even stand up for themselves? How can we mm -hmm. help one another? Sure. Uh, actually, the most powerful intervention to stop the cycle of bullying and incivility is not for the target to speak up. It's for mm. the witness to speak up. What? Okay. So here's a classic example, and I use this example all the time. We tend to, especially in healthcare, we've got that hierarchy, you know, to, you know the executives and, you know, the, the different leadership levels. We have physicians, nurses, support staff, and boom, 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 you're going down the ladder of, of perceived power. Very often, we find people who are incredibly rude and disrespectful to people in a supportive role. So let's say you have a unit secretary, a unit clerk at a desk, okay. and you're say a nursing assistant, or maybe you're a nurse, let's say you're a nurse. And all of a sudden, one of the physicians walks up to the desk and starts yelling at the unit clerk for not getting something that he ordered, blah, blah, blah. What do we usually do? We do this. <laughs> we want to go the other way. Cause like, ah, oh, we're just glad he's not yelling at us. Right. It's for the witness to say time out. The way you're talking to and say the person's name, the way you're talking to Brenda right now is incredibly rude and disrespectful. You need to stop. It's for the witness wow. to speak up on the target's behalf. Way more powerful. Now, we, we teach people to assert themselves too, scripting and all of that. Yeah. But it's so much more powerful when someone else does it on your behalf. And to not jump into and create an argument. But again, no. what I saw you do was you pointed out the behavior. Mm -hmm. You are yelling at her and that needs to stop. You need to stop. Right? Mm -hmm. That type of response. Yep. Wow. Okay. Okay. So we need to stand up, right? We've all seen that show. What is it called? Like, what would you do or something? Oh, I love uh, that show. Do the bystanders, are they yes. going to jump in and say something or yes. not? So we need to start building one another up for that. Um, my friend Raleigh, who he is in the HR world, he brought up a good comment here. And then it makes me ask the question because he said, you know, that those folks should notify HR, notify the leadership and whatnot. So, so where's that line? When do we address it ourselves versus when do we go to, you know, organizational leadership or HR, right? Right, right. Uh, great question. That could be a whole other webinar in itself. Okay. That's true. But <laughs> That's true. I, I look at informal and formal um, solutions okay. so, or strategies. So if, if I'm uh, an employee and I'm being treated poorly by my other employees or, you know, by my coworkers, uh, at first we recommend that you just have a conversation with that person. Like, you know, yesterday at the meeting, you stood up, you pointed your finger at me, you know, you interrupted me. And, you know, I felt really embarrassed by that. Can we talk about it? So you teach people assertive communication, honest and respectful. Okay. Mm. You start the informal route first in most cases, not all, but okay. in most, like we want to have, you know, sometimes they refer to it as a coffee conversation. Hey, can we just talk about right. something that happened yesterday? You know, it made me really uncomfortable, or you could even say it makes me uncomfortable even bringing this up and it may make you uncomfortable, and uncomfortable, but it's important that we have the conversation. So you start informal first. If you're not getting any resolution or the behavior gets worse, Ooh. go to your direct, like your boss, whoever you would say your boss is, go to your boss. And I would always, I tell people, start a documentation trail. Even if we, you never use it, 
and yeah. include date, time, were there any witnesses, any verbatim comments? Yes. Somebody said, like I had a nursing assistant that said to my nurse in the hallway in front of patient rooms, my boyfriend knows what shuttle you take. He's going to be waiting and he's going to beat the SHIT out of you. Although she said those <laughs> words. I got so much documentation from other people and they all said that same thing. So it was kind of a slam dunk. But you start informal, start a documentation trail. If it continues, go to your boss. And then from there, I would take it to HR. Okay. Um, because, and, and I, I love that HR is on the call because when I go into organizations and do work related to bullying and incivility, I tell them I won't do this work without HR. There we go. Without, yeah. I can't mm -hmm. get in without HR, Raleigh. There you go. Yep. <laughs> it's a partnership. So, yes. Awesome. So we got another great question that asked, um, what are some tips on handling the situation if the organizational leader is the bully? <laughs> what do we do? What do we do? Yes. Um, I can say that I've been in that situation as a consultant and that's where you realize that you're, you're limited because and I'm just going to say, when, when we look at how do you really transform a culture, it's a, our approach is a top down, bottom up and everything in approach. But if your <laughs> leaders yeah. are buying into this and they're part of the problem, you're mm -hmm. going to have difficulty. I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And, and I don't know that I have a, oh, just do these three things and it'll make it all better you have to build a compelling case for them. There has to be, uh, these are behaviors that are showing up. Right. This is how it's affecting the organization. And there's numerous studies that are out there and you could do some, you know, you could do your own assessments in the organization. And then there needs to be a candid, frank conversation with that executive leader from someone in the organization that they respect or that is at least equal to them about their behavior. Okay. And there are different things like you could do 360 evaluations and all those things, but sometimes people just don't have any self-awareness. And even if you show them a video camera of how they're acting, they will still deny it. Right. So, not <laughs> easy. That mm -hmm. does happen. That does happen. Okay. So right now we have massive turnover happening, right? Mm -hmm. Massive amounts of people that are quitting. And I am hearing right now well, I know she's the problem, but we just need bodies, right? So I can't possibly let someone go that I know is bullying others or causing um, a toxic environment for, for my new hires or anyone else, but at least she shows up, Renee. At least she does the job, whether it's healthcare or not healthcare, you know, at least she's showing up. I can't afford to lose one more person. What would you say in that situation? I know it, it's so sad. We've used silence as a strategy for decades. And now any attempt any leader has made to address disruptive behaviors has stopped because to your point, well, in, in my world, a bad nurse is better than no nurse. And so we're even- Wait, say that again. Likely. I said a bad nurse is better than no nurse. Is what they think. Mm -hmm. That's what they think. Here's the problem with that. It's very short-sighted. It's looking at yes. right now, today, I don't have enough nurses. She's acting a fool over there and she's done this over and over again. And I know I have people who are quitting because of her, but you know what? She's my most competent employee. I can't get rid of her. Right. It's very short-sighted. What I want all of us to do is stretch a little bit and think long-term. Um, in healthcare right now, especially nurses, they're leaving to take traveling jobs. They're retiring because they've had, in, they've done enough. They're leaving the profession altogether. And right. that's what everybody's focusing on with this great resignation. And, um, you know, they can go and make more money somewhere else. But people aren't realizing that they're also leaving because of culture. Yes. And there's Tons. an incredible... A quote by Peter Belcher, who said this, there is nothing that will kill a good employee faster than watching you tolerate a bad one. Mm -hmm. So I get it, Kara. I would, when I was in a, a leadership role and I had a whole team and it was during a, a nursing shortage that we had years ago, I get it. I, I don't want to hold this person accountable because 
they may quit on me. Yeah. But I'm telling you, it's, it's short-term thinking. We have to think long-term because if you don't, you're going to be left with all the problem employees. Right. And I can calculate how much that bad employee is costing the organization in dollars and in turnover. And you really can never get the solid team built Mm -hmm. if that person keeps shoving everybody out the door and keeps chasing away people. So I am telling leaders all the time, we have to acknowledge, just like you said, short-term versus long-term, you have to acknowledge they are doing more harm than good. Yes, they're showing up. Yes, they're providing great care or great deliverables, great services for your customers, but they are ultimately doing more harm than good. And you can never build the company culture that you want to have if you allow that crap, pardon me, to happen. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and it's so. so sad because I feel for these leaders. Right. I have incredible empathy for them. And I just, I try to, you know, just encourage them. It may feel that things get a little worse, right. but over time, and that's what we're looking here is we're, we're building a culture and mm-hmm. we're setting the expectations. You will be more respected as a leader by holding these people accountable for their conduct. And, and I don't believe to just go in and, okay, you're, you're a problem, fire you, get rid of her, this person's got to go. Mm-hmm. I, I do, um, uh, my philosophy is uh, if you have an honest conversation with somebody who is you know, being very disruptive, that you may be good at what you do basically, but the way you treat people here is not okay. And you know, moving forward, this is what I want to see from you. A lot of people will step up, not all, but I think you have to give them an opportunity. There are some people who have been behaving badly for decades that nobody's ever sat down and had an honest conversation with them about their behavior. And going back to that executive, I bet that's true for that executive too. Nobody's actually said, sat down with that person and said, do you know that people in this organization claim that you're the biggest bully of them all? And let's talk about that because that's not okay. You're the leader here. And just to have a conversation, an honest conversation with someone. Yeah. I wish I had counted how many times you said honest during this webinar. (laughs) (laughs) That is, that just keeps coming back to be the key that we have to have a candid, genuine, authentic, honest conversation with folks about behavior. That's my biggest takeaway here is again, not, she didn't talk about necessarily all the feelings and, and having to go into that piece, but just the starting with the behavior conversation, what is expected, what is not, what is allowable, what is not, um, what has offended, you know, and and versus what has not and that type of thing. So, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I, before we wrap up, okay, this is going to get uncomfortable. Uh for me and maybe you and everybody listening. Um, But I I do want to address one thing that we have seen just in the past two years in our work environments around incivility. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask about what if I find out someone on, on the team or people start to find out on the team, we have different political views. We have different views on religion or other things, right? Um, you, you saw a, a big influx of tension, I would say, when people started bringing more of that to work over the last two years or, or wearing certain buttons or hats or anything like that um, in, into work or even seeing a bumper sticker on their car in the parking lot. And so I just want to ask your advice of uh, I love the, am I the bully, right? I mean, we want to go back to that assessment and things, but is there, is there any other piece of advice that we haven't covered yet as to how we can make sure we're being more civil with one another and respecting and honoring differences and saying, it's okay that we're not on the same page with things. We can still work together um, right. and, and be successful at that. So I just wanted to bring that up because I know when I hear incivility, sometimes I think that people start hating each other and, and being rude to one another just because of those things. Any, any thoughts or, or suggestions around that? Um, 
Yes. And, and again, this isn't going to be, oh, just do one, two, and three, and all the problems will be solved because we're dealing sure. with human behavior here. And, and it's really interesting when you talk, you know, you mentioned politics on my social media and even all the articles that I write, I don't address politics, even though people have encouraged me, oh, you need to write about this. <laughs> because no matter what I say, I will offend someone. And more than just someone, a big group of people. Sure. There are some things that we should never be discussing at work, especially if it's not like if we're not working in politics or we're not working in some organ, you know, nonprofit organization that's taking a look at um, like LGTB and all of that. Okay. There are certain things, and, and I think they, there needs to be a discussion as a team. What's okay to talk about and discuss at work? Because I think engaging in conversations with people who think differently than us is so valuable. We talk about diversity, inclusion, equity, all of that. I think there is such potential for making dramatic improvements in our organizations, but there needs to be some ground rules set first. And this should be talked about as a team, like we know, think about the vaccines to get vaccinated or not. Oh my God. Right. People, <laughs> every day of my life, I had nurse leaders reaching out to me to say, I'm having a battle in my department over, should we get vaccinated or not? And who, you know, they're not our, you know, they shouldn't have a right to tell us, but oh my gosh. Uh, if we look at conflict, there is true conflict versus false conflict. False, and we won't get into it if you don't have time. False conflict is different. somebody having a different opinion than you or you having no control over something. So if you're, so I had an, a hospital, you know, people reached out to me from the state of Oregon and they said, you know, this hospital is mandating we get vaccines. And it was a big deal. And I said, the state of Oregon mandated it. <laughs> it wasn't your hospital. The state of Oregon, you have no control over it. So if you have no control over it, then it, it's not discussed in the workplace. Um, in, in that way, debating over should we or shouldn't we, you don't have a choice. If it's a different opinion, you say, these are things we do not talk about in the workspace. Hmm. Because no matter what, you will offend someone. And that means you're judging someone and we don't judge people here. So it's part of it. It's, it's not a one, two, three. It's a movement to respect everybody's opinion, even if their opinion is the complete polar opposite of yours. And what conversations are okay to have at work and what conversations are not. And you see somebody with a bumper sticker who's advocating for something that you would advocate the complete opposite against. Mm -hmm. Does that affect the relationship you have with them? Maybe, but when you cross the threshold of your workspace, it's game on. And I don't know, Kara, it's such a big problem right now. And I talked about using the script, you know, I'm offended by that comment. I think right now we sometimes swing the pendulum so far the other way that we're offended by everything. Right, right. You've got somebody, I'm sure oh, even right on this call that's saying, oh yeah, well, you tell people to tell them when they're offended, they're just going to say that all the time. And Oh my gosh. Yeah, yes, I think yeah. there needs to be a balance there, but mm -hmm. as the leader in an organization, it's your responsibility to set the expectations on what, type, what types of conversations are we having here at work beyond the work that we do? Yes. What's okay and what's not okay. Yeah, absolutely. It all comes back to communicating those expectations, right? Yes. So if you all haven't already pulled up healthyworkforceinstitute.com, that is Dr. Renee Thompson's website. And she's got workshops and courses and bring her into your organization. Um, have these conversations. Definitely follow her on LinkedIn because she's got great blogs and content there and whatnot. And also she's got a special bonus for us today. If On her website, she sells amazing things that will help eliminate bullying and incivility, some products, books, and that little button, I don't know if you guys can see it, but her button says, be kind. Oh, other side. There it is. <laughs> it says, be <laughs> kind. You can buy be kind buttons. So you get 20% off of her website if you put in bonus 
20, B-O-N-U-S-2-0, bonus 20 on her website e-commerce page. And everybody watching this today uh, and the playback, you can go get 20% off of any of those items. So thank you so much. We did not get to cover every single question that came in because this is such a hot topic. So if we didn't get your question answered, um, we'll try to get those over to Renee and have her respond via email if possible. But feel free to reach out to her on her website or through LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And she would love to talk with you and your team about this. So thank you so much for your time, Renee. It's great to chat with you, friend, and to have you. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with our followers. And of course, follow magnetculture.com online and on YouTube. Um, and we will have this video if you want to show this video to your leadership team or maybe pass it along to some people that need some self-awareness in this space. Uh, it will be up on our YouTube page for Magnet Culture here in the next couple of days. So thank you all so much. Have a great week. And more than anything, be kind to oh one God. another. <laughs> thank you. Right? Thanks, Sarah. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone.